from the third dimension with its own brain. Virtual Boy. See it now in 3D. Hello everyone, welcome to another episode of Player One Start. Today we're going to talk about one of the most anticipated consoles I wanted to feature on this channel, the Virtual Boy. After years of searching through yard sales, thrift stores, and online, I finally was able to grab a Virtual Boy. The Virtual Boy is a 32-bit tabletop video game console developed and manufactured by Nintendo. It was released in 1995 and marketed as the first console capable of displaying stereoscopic 3D graphics. The player uses the console in a manner style to a head-mounted display. They have to place their head up against the eyepiece in order to see the red monochrome display. The game uses a parallax effect to create the illusion of depth. However, sales failed to meet targets, and by early 1996, Nintendo had ceased distribution and game development, only ever releasing 22 games for the system. Development of the Virtual Boy lasted for four years, and began originally under the project name of VR32. Nintendo had entered a licensing agreement to use a 3D LED eyepiece technology originally developed by a company called Reflection Technology. Over the course of the development of this console, the console technology was scaled down due to high costs and potential health concerns. Also, an increasing amount of the company resources were being reallocated to the Nintendo 64 development, which was to be Nintendo's next flagship product. Another thing that could have led to the downfall of the console was that lead game designer Shigeru Miyamoto, known for designing games such as Zelda and Star Fox, as well as Mario, had little involvement with the Virtual Boy software. So in the mid-90s, when the console wars were really getting very heated between Nintendo and Sega, everyone was aware of every console coming out that was going to, you know, what was going to be the next big thing? Who was going to win, Sega or Nintendo? The first console to enter this war would be the Sega Saturn. Sega had stunned everyone in the video game industry, including its own development team, by announcing that the console would go on sale before anyone else's. It was expected to be released in the fall of 1995, but instead was released right after the E3 press conference. A new competitor to the field, Sony, was gearing up to release their PlayStation that fall as well. And with all of the buzz around the new consoles, Nintendo was starting to feel left out of the fray. As a stopgap measure to keep Nintendo in the focus of the media, they decided to release the Virtual Boy much earlier than intended. So a little bit of context, Nintendo was already late to the 16-bit war, being the last competitor to release a 16-bit console, at least here in North America. So the PC Engine slash Turbo Graphics and Sega Genesis had already been out for at least a couple years before Nintendo released their 16-bit console. Fast forwarding to the 32-bit wars, Sega wanted to get the jump on Nintendo once again and release their Saturn before they were going to release their next console. So since Nintendo's console was so far away, they were really advertising and pushing the Virtual Boy and it would raise expectations of the gamers at that time that they would, at least in my mind, really disappoint. So my first experience with this console was when we rented it from our local video store in town. And this was very common as Nintendo had a hard time marketing the 3D graphics or the virtual reality graphics that they would have because you had to actually see it in the console to experience it. So when I bought this console, everything worked great and I was very excited, but then I ran into a problem. As soon as I got it home, it almost seemed like the first game I tried at home, all of a sudden one of the displays quit working. And at first, you really don't know what's going on because one of your eyes just seems to blink out and it gave me an instant headache. So that was a bit disorienting. So I decided to go ahead and try to fix the display myself. Usually I don't attempt to fix consoles like this once they are broken because I'm afraid of damaging them. But in this case, I figured I can't make it worse than it is because it's not working now. So I decided to go ahead and take it apart. I actually have two different types of security bits, one for Sega Genesis and one for Nintendo, and it turns out that the Virtual Boy uses the one for Sega Genesis. So it was very fortunate, the first thing I did was start taking off all the security screws on the back. But then I ran into a problem. These other screws are too far down for my bit to reach. Ugh. So this halted my project, at least for the meantime, and I had to wait 
for a replacement screwdriver to come in the mail. Luckily, it came on time. I went to the mailbox, and there it was. So this particular screwdriver I got from Amazon. It actually came in a two-pack. It has the same security bits as I had before, only these screwdrivers have a much longer length. And these did the trick. And since we have it open, we can go ahead and take a look at some of the internals of the Virtual Boy. You'll notice that it's very simplistic in its design. There's not really much technology here. The Virtual Boy uses a customized NEC V810 32-bit processor, running at 20 MHz. It has a few RAM chips in here. It has a couple of 128V RAM chips, 128 kilobytes of DRAM, and 64 kilobytes of WRAM. It runs on six AA batteries or the power adapter. For sound, it uses a custom virtual sound unit with five wave channels and one noise channel. And other than the displays, this is the main technology of the Virtual Boy. All right, next I'm going to move the speaker off to the side. It's just gonna make it easier to uh, take the screws out of the logic board here for the display. I'm going to unhook the display from the motherboard. And I'm also going to unscrew the display chip from the oscillating mirror assembly. I'm noting that there is a ground cable that is screwed in here. I want to make sure I put this back in when I'm done. Alright, and here's the chip that produces the screen image. Now this is only part of it. It actually only does a solid color, but the oscillating mirrors inside of the console actually move so fast that your persistence of vision makes it look like there is a solid screen. Now bear with me on this step. I'm actually going to preheat my oven to 200 degrees so I can actually bake this chip into working. I'm going to use a baking sheet so it protects it from the heating element. And I'm also going to put a sheet of aluminum foil on here so it doesn't stick to the baking sheet. I laid the video chip with the ribbon cable sticking up because this is going to let me know when the chip has baked long enough. Now that my oven's preheated, I'm going to go ahead and stick it in. I had set my timer for five minutes, but I didn't end up using the entire time because my oven must have been heated up already. And I'm going to speed up the footage here. This is what I want to see from the ribbon cable when the chip is baking. You're actually supposed to be able to see it physically go down and almost make contact with the aluminum foil. When that happens, the chip is done. As soon as I take it out of the oven, I'm going to use a number two pencil because it has flat ridges, and I'm going to press where the ribbon cable makes contact with the chip. And I'm gonna hold it for about 15 seconds on each side, and then I'm going to tape it with some masking tape to help reinforce that connection. Supposedly, this is what's causing the issue of the glitching display. Some of the parts of this cable may be only making intermittent contact with the actual board. All right, next I'm going to reassemble the console just a little bit so I can test it out and see if it works. So that is a fantastic result. I can't believe that on the first try I got this thing working. And not only that, but it's been about seven days now since I've applied that fix, and it still works great. I'm very confident that this will last at least as long as I'm going to play this console. While I was at it, 
decided to go ahead and order a replacement for the eye shade visor because every time I put my face up to it, even though I've cleaned it with soap and water, it is just disintegrating little by little each time I put my head up to it. Every time I pull away, it leaves a, just a streak of black little crumbly things all over my face. You know, this thing has served its purpose for a number of years. I don't think it was ever intended to last this long, so I decided to go ahead and order a replacement. After another trip to Amazon and another two days in the mail, I got a replacement eye shade visor for the Virtual Boy. Mario's Tennis was released in 1995 as a pack-in title for the Virtual Boy. The game initially had a working title of Mario's Dream Tennis upon its announcement. This game was developed by Nintendo's R&D One, with director Gunpei Yokoi. This was the same team responsible for the development of the Virtual Boy itself. Yokoi's success with the Game Boy line of systems, coupled with the public's general belief that it was too early for the next generation of systems, due to the failure of systems such as the 3DO and the Atari Jaguar, led the team to brainstorm different approaches that could be taken. Mario's Tennis was the end result on the software end. It was one of four launch games that were released alongside the console. The game received mixed reviews from critics. A common complaint cited by reviewers was the fact that Tennis was a sports game that lacked multiplayer mode. However, with an expansion port on the console itself, it can be assumed that Nintendo had planned to add this feature later. However, all critics applauded the impressive 3D visuals, stating that Mario Tennis showcased the capabilities of the hardware right away. In this game, you can control one of seven different characters. Action is viewed from behind the main character, giving you a third-person perspective. The Virtual Boy's 3D graphics allow the player to perceive depth within the tennis court, allowing for better perception in the distance between the tennis ball and the player. Unlike later entries in the Mario Tennis series, items such as power-up, special power shots, or external obstacles interfering with the game are missing in this one. This game simply focuses on the tennis fundamentals. Overall, I feel that this is a good intro title to the Virtual Boy, however the price of this console does not make it worth it simply for this title. Tolero Boxer is, in my opinion, the best example of virtual reality on the Virtual Boy, at least out of the games that I own here. This game takes place in the 22nd century, where humans have developed a new type of robotic science called Tello Robotics. Eventually a competition was formed in order to prove which robots were the best. The goal of this game is to battle all of the enemy Tolero Boxers in order in order to become the champion of them all. This can be accomplished by attacking the enemy enough times in order to reduce its strength meter to zero. Doing so results in a knockout. In all, there are five rounds of each boxer, each round lasting a total of one minute. If there is no clear winner after the fifth match, the winner will be decided based on how much strength they have left. The controls here take a little bit of getting used to. You have to use the dual D-pads to control where your hands are on the screen. You move your hands around to block punches and to aim where your punches land. The triggers on each side of the controller control which hand you hit with. When this game came out, it was received very poorly among critics. Some reviewers criticized the game, saying that there were absolutely no high points to it, and that the 3D was ineffective with this one. At the same time, Super Punch-Out! was being released for the Super Nintendo, and it was viewed as a much better boxing game.
That said, I feel this game is... okay. It's definitely the best boxing game on the Virtual Boy, mainly because it's the only one. But I feel the 3D works well here, except for the sprites have a lot of depth, but there's not a lot of 3D with them. I do like the fact that the screen goes to static when you get knocked out. Other than that, I wouldn't say this is a must-have game for the system, but it's definitely not as bad as the critics say. Virtual Boy Wario Land is a platforming video game, also developed and published by Nintendo for the Virtual Boy system in 1995. It stars Wario in his own platforming adventure. This game is very similar to the original Wario Land, originally billed as Super Mario Land 3. Wario can collect different hats to give himself new abilities. The Dragon Hat allows Wario to use a flamethrower against his enemies. The Bull Helmet makes his rush attack faster and a lot more powerful, along with the ability to do a ground pound, which can be used to crush enemies and break blocks that cannot be hit from the sides. The developers try to incorporate the technology of the Virtual Boy into the game. For example, many stages have three-dimensional areas in their backgrounds, accessible by Wario by using special blocks. Wario can also jump into the background, a technique that would be used later on in games that were not in 3D. The game controls similar to its other counterparts, and does not really make use of the second D-pad, only using the first D-pad, the A and B button, and the Start button respectively. Upon its release, the game received mixed reviews. Some said that while the game would appeal to hardcore Mario fans, that it offered no significant advancements over the old Mario platform jumping games. Reviewers also stated that the 3D mechanics had no real impact on the gameplay. However, in retrospect, criticism for this game has been universally favorable. It has been named as one of the best games on the Virtual Boy, and one of the best in the Wario series. It has long since been rumored that this game would be redeveloped for the Nintendo 3DS, however, as of the making of this video, no such undertaking has been announced by Nintendo. Which is really a shame, because this game is actually very good, and I would say that this game would make it worth it to play the Virtual Boy. It doesn't really take advantage of the 3D effects of the Virtual Boy, but it is, I would almost say, the best Wario game I have played. I can say that while you'll be tempted to play this game in one sitting, it is advisable to take breaks, as the system suggests. So what are my thoughts on The Virtual Boy? First off, I think it lives up to the hype I had in my own head, mainly because I played this as a kid and I knew that when I bought this console, it was going to be displayed on a shelf most of its life. You know, I may have some people who try it out and play it. I did get it working because I do want people to be able to play it, especially myself. But for those of you who want to collect this console, keep in mind that this isn't going to be a console that you're gonna to wanna to play for hours on end every day. There's not a large selection of games, and the health warnings that Nintendo puts out for this console, in my mind, are valid. There are some people who say that they can play this console for a while without any issues. However, I do find myself getting headaches with this console if I play it for an extended period of time. So keep that in mind if you want to collect this console. You know, the money I paid for it is going to be well worth it because I'm a collector, but if you're just buying this console just to play the games and you don't really care about having the retro hardware, it may not be worth it to you. Now that said, are the games on this console worth it? Well, I think the pack-in title, Mario Tennis, which is the most common to find, I think that game may make it worth it in itself. I mean, it is, in essence, a 3D title for tennis. And I think that was the perfect title for Nintendo to choose to showcase the abilities of the Virtual Boy. The second best game I like for the system is Wario Land. And that's because I've always been a fan of the Wario titles. My favorite for a while has still been the Game Boy version, but I really think that this one may be my new favorite. It's just too soon for me to tell, you know, if it does stand the test of time. However, this is a title that doesn't need to be on the Virtual Boy. Yes, there are effects in this game that take advantage of the 3D platforming. Like you see those huge giant spikes that fly towards your face and then fly away. And then you have those sections where you can jump from the foreground into the background. I mean, those effects are really neat, 
the actual mechanics of the game don't require it to be on Virtual Boy. You could play this on any other console and it would still be the same exact gameplay. And I think that goes for maybe the majority of titles on this console. A lot of them don't really need to be in there, but it is kind of neat to have them. The game I think had the best visual effects is Tolero Boxer. And yes, I listened to you in the comments. When I was doing my unboxing video, I kept calling it Tarot Boxer. Uh, that's because I didn't see the L when I was, you know, still just, let's just say I was blinded by nostalgia and I really wanted to play the console. But anyway, Tolero Boxer, I think, made the best use of it. It's the only game that I have played for this console that really feels like I am actually in a virtual reality environment. You have a first person perspective, you are hitting someone in the background, I mean, seeing your fist move uh, towards you and away from you so you can actually see it actually makes it a very good boxing game. And I'll tell you, when you do get hit and you go down and you're knocked out, I mean, you really do feel it because the Virtual Boy screen that moves to static and then goes out, I mean, it really gives you the look that I would feel if you got knocked out. So overall, this console is great, I think, because of its place in history. It is considered Nintendo's biggest failure. And I think it's mainly because it was rushed. They weren't able to work out all the bugs with the system. I think that if they actually had enough time to do it, they might not have chose the color red. But overall, I think this console is worth it to me. Uh, you guys will have to make the determination for yourselves. But now I can honestly say that I own every single Nintendo console they've released. I'm still looking for Game & Watches and maybe their Pong clone consoles. Something like that would be neat. All right, well, that about wraps it up for this episode. Remember, if you like what you see, please hit that like or subscribe button and really help me out. And if you're interested in supporting this channel in other ways, please go ahead and visit my Patreon page at patreon.com slash player one start. Now that said, I really want to thank you guys for your support of this channel and stay tuned because I have more content coming. I'll see you guys next time. Yeah.